Okay. So you want to find out where does a 95% confident ellip confidence ellipse come from. Yeah. I'm going to try to keep this at, at the high school level as much as possible. You can read all of this in that awesome book, which I'm still working through. I'm maybe a quarter of the way through. It's a lot. This is like PhD level statistics. You would not, you'll never see this as an undergrad, as an undergrad, unless you're at some really crazy math college. This is like PhD level math. Okay, so there's this idea of uh, distance. Let's start with that. Let's say I'm on the xy plane. How would you calculate the distance between these two points? Uh, x1, y1, x2, y2. How would you normally calculate the distance here? Well, you would use the distance formula, which we learned as, we learned as juniors. It's going to be x minus x1 squared plus y1, oh, y1 minus y2 squared, and then you take the square root of that. That's the basic idea. However, so all that works with like physical distance and stuff, that's not good enough when we're talking about data, all right? Uh, let's say I want a perfectly fair way of measuring the distance between two by bivariate data, meaning I got two variables. Let's say, how old are you and what's your GPA? Something like that. So I want to measure, you know, the relationship between them. So let's say, here's my GPA and here's my hair length. Uh, you know what, instead of hair length, how about we do, uh, how tall are you in centimeters? So height in centimeters. I'm going to make that like, this is several hundred centimeters. Your GPA only goes to four. And this thing could go up to uh, however many centimeters, so like 200 centimeters maybe. That's, that's really tall by the way, that's two meters, so. Okay, this is zero to four, so this is obviously really, really small. And this is 0 to 200, so really, really big. How would you measure the difference, <clears throat> the statistical di distance between these two points? Well, obviously, I could still use the Euclidean distance, and that would be fine. However, notice how there's this distance here. Uh, what if I take this exact same distance, but I'm going to do it like this? So in a Euclidean sense, it's still the same distance. However, like this would be actually a little taller. However, uh, something changed, right? This, let's suppose that this is a GPA of uh, three. This is a GPA of uh, two. I know this looks really bad, but let's put that as a one for now, okay? So let's say this was three and this was two. That's the difference between a C and a B. That's almost a, that's almost a, that's a quarter of the distance, right? And, uh, oh, okay. And from here to here, this is like a third of the distance. Now, what if we're talking about these two points? Well, this is more like two, let's say 2.7 and 2.6. Okay, so now the difference between these two in terms of GPA is really, really small. But this one is still a, basically a third of the distance in the height. See what I mean? So something radical changed in terms of the GPA. Like the distance between the GPA is now really, really small on the grand scheme of things. But relatively, the, like the intensity of the height, this, this distance could be like 50 centimeters, right? It went from like 48 centimeters to 50 centimeters, like almost no real difference. But in a Euclidean sense, it's still the exact same distance. So as you can see, the Euclidean distance isn't gonna cut it anymore. It doesn't reflect the degree of change in, the G, in my x-axis. And the reason is really simple. It's because this height thing is overrepresentative 
it has way too much power. Like this is from zero to 200, that this is only from zero to four. So one, one centimeter here is really, really small, but one GPA right here is huge. We wanna be able to reflect that in a number. So instead of talking about raw numbers, like the Euclidean distance, which is this one, we're gonna standardize the units a bit. So let's modify this to be D is equal to the square root. And instead of talking about um, Euclidean distance, we're gonna talk about standard deviations, okay? So we're gonna standardize these distances. And I'm gonna divide this by basically, um, in fact, let me, let me rewrite this. Instead of saying x1 minus x2, I'm going to say x1 minus x2 over the standard deviation, just in terms of standard deviations. That's the only real modification I'm going to do. And the same thing here, y1 minus y2, but I'm going to put that in terms of standard deviations for the y. So now, these standard deviations are bigger, these standard deviations are smaller, but one standard deviation is basically the same across any bell curve. So now I've standardized my distances. Are you with me so far? Uh, I'm kind of confused on that part. All right. Why did we put this in here? Yeah. Because the basic Euclidean distance formula is not going to tell us all the information that we want. Like all of the points and how far they are. Yeah, even, even though this point, th this distance, and this distance are exactly the same, if you were a... If you were a student and I said, I am going to just adjust your distance like this a little bit, sir, you would have big concerns. <laughs> oh, I got you. you would have huge concerns. If this were your GPA, you'd be like, whoa, sir, this is actually really small, but from two to three, that's like going from a C to a B. That's way, or I'm sorry, a B to a, an, an A, basically. That's a huge difference, sir. Right? You would have great concern. But if you said, all right, I'm gonna change your height from 48, you know, I'm gonna change this from 48, 50 centimeters to 50 centimeters, you'd be like, okay. So changing it from here to here, nothing happens here. But if you change it from here to here, um, you'd be super concerned. Mm -hmm. This does not reflect your concern here. Oh, okay. It doesn't reflect your concern. It doesn't reflect the change in intensity. So to help with that, we're actually going to not talk about raw units. We need to standardize it, hence the name standard deviation. That's why it's called that. We're going to basically standardize all of our rules so that way one standard deviation here will be the same as one standard deviation up here. A standard deviation coming from the bell curve, which would, the bell curve is like this, where this is the mean, I'm sure you've seen this before. That's about one standard deviation. And this is also one standard deviation. And then this would be two standard deviations. And that would be 95%? You, you are remembering stuff, very good. This would be two standard deviations. This is a standard unit of measurement in terms of data. So we're gonna do the exact same thing here. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, now let's take this formula and run with it, okay? Everybody, lunch is over. If you have uh, any questions, please type it in the chat. I'm just making this quick video for people who are interested. So that's why we needed to standardize stuff. Now let's take this formula and run with it. I hate radicals, don't you? So let's adjust this and just instead of talking about distance, we're going to talk about squared distances. Because, you know, if, if I say what's the distance from the top point to the bottom point, it might be a negative number. And we don't want to have negative distances, plus radicals suck. So let's just, instead of that, let's just talk about squared distances. Right now we have a, like a, a squared distance, a standardized squared distance with two variables. By the way, this can extend to as many variables as you want. It doesn't have to be two. It could be x, y, z. It could be x, y, z, and then a fourth component. These variables could be your height, your GPA, how far you are from LVA, 
what's the hue of your eye color, your shoe size, whatever. Okay, you could add as many pieces of variables as you want, but the distance formula will always be the same. Now, um, to keep it simple, I'm actually going to start by, instead of doing two variables, I'm going to bring it back down to one, and then I'm going to generalize to many variables. So let's just assume there's only one variable for now. And then this will make sense in just a second. Okay. The glare here is really bad. I'm going to rewrite this a little bit, okay? Into something that will make sense in just a second. So I just passed this through to the other side and I squared it basically. Okay. In fact, it's, it's probably better to write it like this. I can swap places with them due to the laws of exponents. I can do that. By the way, what is sigma squared? What else do we call that? That's called the variance. The square of the standard deviation is also called the variance. If you didn't know that, now you know. Okay. The variance is the average squared distance from the mean. Okay. And that's where the word variance, that, that's, that's the variance matrix, by the way. This is where our covariance matrix come from. Okay. So this, is, this works perfectly well for one variable, a squared distance between two points. Now, we're not terribly interested in the distance between two points. We are interested in knowing the distance from the center. So what if we just changed that to basic x, and we'll change x2 to the middle, x bar. We're very interested in knowing how far you are from the middle. And we'll do the same thing over here. OK, this is starting to look nicer. So now this is basically my squared distance from the mean. So, so far we've got a squared, the standardized squared distance from the mean. And the mean is the the mean is the middle point, the average. Okay. So what's the average x value? What's the average y value? There will be one point in the very center of all your data called the mean point. Wait, and that's not zero, zero, that's just the middle. It's point the middle of your data. data. It's the okay. exact middle point of your data. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> now, we could take this and extend it to multiple variables through the use of matrices. So for now, we'll call this D squared, capital D squared. And we're going to write this as a system of matrices. This is going to, I'm going to put, I'm going to put a little prime here because this is going to be represented as a row column, uh, a row uh, vector, a row vector. This one is my inverse covariance matrix, is where that comes from. Oh, yes, sir. Okay. Um, around one, whenever you're pretty much done with your lesson, can I see Josh? Absolutely, sir. Yeah, near the end of the block. Yes, sir. Comes on down, okay? Okay. That, that could be good. So, this is my inverse covariance matrix. This extends to a uh, covariance matrix. I assume you know what that is, right? Probably. You, you have it in two different papers. And then over here, we're going to have another matrix. But this one's going to be a column vector. This is going to spit out one scalar number, one basic number. It could be like 4.22. It'll be a distance. But this will be a generalized squared distance from the mean, which takes into account all of these things over here. And it'll give you one non-Euclidean. It'll be a real standardized difference from the mean, and it doesn't matter in what direction you're pointing at. OK? Beautiful. <clears throat> now. The nice thing about this is it kind of defines an ellipse. This is a, a nice equation for the idea of an ellipse. So what does that mean? And we're, getting, we're finally getting to what you're talking about here. How do you come up with a confidence ellipse? If you've got a bunch of data like this, like that, and your middle point, let's put a little x right where your middle point is. 
a distance, a generalized square distance of the mean is going to be, you know, that there, that there. And this distance will be the same as this distance. It'll be the same as this distance. It'll be the same as this distance. Like, this is all the exact same distance. Mm -hmm. And it tr basically traces out an ellipse. Wait, the long ones are the same distance as the short ones? Yes, the long ones are the same generalized distance from the mean. Notice how if we did a Euclidean thing, it wouldn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. But let's say this is like two standard deviations in this direction. That's two standard deviations in that direction. Two standard deviations in that direction. It's all in terms of standard deviations. Okay. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, it's, uh, oh okay. So that would be like one unit, then that would be like two units. Uh, yeah. I mean, let's say this is let's let's just make it up, and let's say this is two standard deviations going that direction, roughly. It would also be two standard deviations going that way. Even though it's longer. No, no. They're the same statistical distance. Not Euclidean distance. They're the same statistical distance. Okay. Right? Remember, like, 2.6 to 2.7 was really, really small. Uh, but from 2 to 3, it's huge. Oh, 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 Remember okay. that? Yeah, we, we, had, that. we had to do it that way. So instead of talking about raw numbers, we're going to talk about standard deviations. So we want to think of these in terms of standard deviations. So this distance is the same as that distance. It's the same as that distance. And that distance is represented by this number. It's the square distance from the mean. In fact, we have a name for this. It's called the generalized square distance from the mean. Cool? Now, there's a reason I drew these axes in this direction, because these are your eigenvectors for your regular covariance matrix. Okay, these axes are basically your eigenvectors. We'll represent that with little e sub i. Okay, mm -hmm. the length is always, and this comes from, um, this, this one gets a little weird, but the length of these axes is going to depend on some c value. So if we let this be represented by a c squared value, well, then the distance, we'd have to kind of take the square root of it a little bit, but the eigenvalue uh, happens before the square root. So long story short, the length of the axis is going to just be C times the square root of each respective eigenvector, uh, eigenvalue for the covariance matrix. Not the inverse covariance matrix like I originally thought. I, I was very stupid. It was actually of the original covariance matrix. They're always going to point in that direction. And because this is, you got to think of this as C squared, and this lambda value applies before the squared happens, you actually need to take the square root of it and multiply it by the C value. Okay? Now, we're almost done. Oh, let me get back to you. If we assume, if we assume that these two pieces of variables follow a normal distribution, then we can actually think of these distances in terms of a chi-squared distribution. In fact, this is where the chi-squared distribution comes from. Why do we call it the chi-squared distribution? Well, this is going to be normal. This is going to follow a normal distribution. This is also going to follow a normal distribution. What happens when we sum up these squared distributions? It follows, this sum of distributions also follows a distribution, doesn't it? It follows what we call the chi-squared distribution. That's literally where it comes from, where you're summing up a bunch of normal distributions that are each squared it follows this distribution, and since there are only two variables here, this would have two degrees of freedom. That's ultimately where the chi-squared distribution comes from, by the way. It comes from this exact idea. Okay. So because of that, we can call C, like C squared, the chi-squared. And in fact, 
we could do this. Any piece of data that is less than a particular chi-squared value is going to have that probability of happening. Because this, this follows a chi-squared distribution. The value of chi or the value of? Um, like the critical chi-squared value. Okay. Anything less than a critical chi-squared value is going to have that probability of happening. So for your data, you had two degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. The chi-squared value for two degrees of freedom with 95% confidence was 5.991. Meaning, any data point that has a generalized squared distance from the mean less than 5.991 is going to be within 95% probability of happening within the uh, ellipse. So now we can think of it like this. This is the most common point, the center, the average. As you get further away, it's going to get rarer and rarer. And once you get to the edge here, you have a 5% probability of happening. See? Okay. Or wait, is that on the outside of the edge? Or like uh, right on the edge. Right on the edge. This has a uh, about a 5% chance of happening. Or literally means anything past this point has a 5% chance of happening. Oh, okay. There's a 5% chance that a, that a data point is going to happen outside the ellipse. That's literally what that means because of this particular thing. The further away we get from the center, the more rare it becomes. Okay. Does that make sense? That sure. Makes sense. Okay, hopefully this all makes sense when you rewatch this video. <laughs> now. I'm getting probably like 60, 75% of it, I'd say. Okay, okay. So when I, when I say the, the, the axes are not in pro the problem, it's how far, how big is the ellipse? How, like how, how long are each of these axes is what I mean. How long are, in, in Euclidean terms, how long is each of these axes? Very simply, let's rewrite this as uh, the square root of c squared times lambda. Very literally, I just copy this down right there. And then that's going to be my literal length of each axis. That's how long each of the axes are. So for this one, this has a really small eigenvalue, so it's going to be a little shorter. This one has a long eigenvalue, so it's going to be a little longer. That's how you construct it. And we call this a 95% confidence ellipse, which you can think of it in several different ways, but one way you could think of it is this contains 95% of the density, of the probability density meaning 95% of your data points are going to land right in the center of this, like inside this ellipse. So if 95% of them don't land in there, that means I did it wrong? Uh, well, something happened. Okay. Um, but it, 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 this, it follows this exact process right here. And you can just say, mathematically, if this follows properly, and this is all having to do with your degrees of freedom, by the way, this has 95% probability density. Or if you, if you like a one dimensional thing, this is my. Okay, so the follow up is, um, all right, what does the covariance matrix basically mean of the original data? That's a really great question. going to represent a matrix. The top left entry is going to be the variance of your x's. The bottom right entry is going to be the variance of your y's. And then these are going to be something called your covariance. All right, we'll call that the covariance. And it's the same exact one over here. These are exactly the same. Okay. And since you're dealing with just two pieces of data, this actually gets really, really simple. You got your data. The variance uh, is always going to be just this. It's going to be uh, the average squared distance from the mean. The average, remember, is just you add up all the numbers and then divide by how many there are. So in this case, where it's like i, you know, divided by n. Now, we go a little step further because this, these are samples, I believe, so there's a bit of error. So instead of doing it divided by n, 
just accept this for a fact, we need to subtract one from the denominator. This, for some reason, this just solves an error problem. Just accept it. Okay, that's gonna be there. But loosely, this is the average squared distance from the mean. This, this minus one kinda messes with it a little bit, but just relax. Okay. And this applies for the x's, and this applies for the y's, cool? Covariance matrix works very similarly. where it's going to be, instead of it being squared, it's going to be x minus x bar times y minus y bar. So it looks almost exactly the same, except instead of squaring each one, we're going to multiply. And this will be divided by n minus 1. That's the covariance matrix. And remember where that comes from. It comes from that original equation that I had up here earlier. The generalized square distance from the mean. What I had in the middle was literally this. But to extend that to multiple dimensions, we need to make it a covariance matrix. You just have to accept that that just ha has to happen. Okay. I think, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. In your own words, you will boil down what I have here. But that's ultimately how you get that. Oh, by the way, just as an extra feature, what if you wanted to calculate a maximal ellipse? Would you just make it at 100% confidence? Oh, no. 100% confidence literally would be the entire universe. Oh, okay. No, I'm talking about an estimate for the population maximum. This you don't necessarily need to cover, but it's going to be roughly right about here. Mm -hmm. Meaning we expect the maximum data point to happen along this curve. Let's suppose we wanted that to happen. Well, that means we need to come up with a different five. We need to come up with a different number right there. Everything else stays exactly the same. Okay. But we need a different number. What number should that be? Well, um, would that be your degree of freedom for one? Ha ha ha! No, everything stays the same except for one thing. We need a different number. There's a famous. Well, I don't know. I shouldn't say famous, but there's an article by Chen and Tyler. 1999, where they estimate population maximums off of a bell curve. Population maximum would occur right about here, right about there, on the, on the bell curve. Okay. And there's a way that you can calculate it pretty easily, which is an inverse CDF of this probability. Okay, uh, five, 0 0.5264 raised to the 1 over n power, where n is your sample size. So you had like 40 pieces of data or something. This would be 1 over 40. And it would come up, this would actually be a number that's like 0.9986. Whereas instead of you had 0.95, this would be like 0.9986. It would be really, really close to 1, but not quite 1. Okay. This is the probability we're going to mess with. But instead of this being the inverse... This is the inverse CDF, which is something that's built into your TI-84. Instead of taking the inverse CDF with respect to the normal distribution, we're going to take the inverse CDF with respect to the chi-squared distribution with two degrees of freedom. This is actually going to spit out a number a lot like 5.991. Okay. Except it's going to be bigger. That'll be the number that goes here to give you your maximal ellipse. I can't remember what it is, but I mean, here, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. Um, so if I, if let's, let's go with 40. Um, so I'm going to type in 0 0.5264 raised to the 1 over 40 power. I get 0 0.984. Okay, for, for a, a sample size of 40. Um, if I did an inverse CDF with chi-squared with two degrees of freedom, what do I get? So I'm using Mathematica here for anyone who's, who cares. Here I get 8.281. Huh? 
what to that value then would be bigger than 5.99. Oh, yes. Yeah, this is this. Think of this uh, number over here as 0.95. This is, point, this is 95%. Okay. This is really, really close to 100%. This kind of defines your ending point. This is super advanced, by the way. <laughs> but it's okay. super cool. You can, you can actually get an, it's an estimate, of course. It doesn't mean it is the maximum. It's just an estimate of the maximum based off of your data. But yeah, you can actually draw a line in the sand and be reasonably confident that there is not gonna be any data points past this point, ever. Okay. Neat, yeah. right? So for you, it would be like 8.281. So if you were to calculate this and make these ellipses, instead of 5.991, you put 8.281, and it'll extend this ellipse a little bit. Okay. And make that. And that's where I'm going to end it.